So what you're saying is, if I want my videos to get picked up by the algorithm and get thousands of views every time, all I need to do is include a blooper or stutter in the first, eh, give or take, 20 seconds of a video? Okay. Here's a stutter, stutter, stutter. Is it working? Am I famous yet? No? All right, roll the intro. Hey, Gengar gang, what is going on? My name is Ryan, this is The Analytic Gengar, and welcome to another video. In today's video, we talk about black label BGS investing for Pokemon cards. Um, this is one of those topics, might get a little spicy, but please keep it civil, and hopefully in today's video, what I intend on doing is A, showing the results of a poll that I actually ran here on the channel via the community tab, sharing those results with you all, um, interpreting those results, and then hopefully also breaking down some of the various tidbits that have led me to the conclusion where I'm basically 50-50 on modern black label Pokemon cards because I don't quite think that I should go out of my way to build a collection around them, nor do I think I should ignore a good opportunity to pick up one at a decent price. But with all that said, let's jump right on into some of this data and some of this information to hopefully delve a little deeper into the complexity that is black label investing. So first up, let's talk about the poll that was run on the channel. On the channel about four days ago, I ran a poll that said, hey, what are your thoughts on modern black labels for Pokemon cards? Meaning, what are your thoughts on those cards that get submitted to BGS, get graded with a black label, all 10s, pristine 10, all the way around? And yeah, tell me about it. So what I did was, was I provided five different options and the five options kind of striate across the amount of intensity that you may choose to favor black labels with. So they are the superior way to invest. 21% of you said that. 36% of you, the single largest amount of the responses went to, they're one of the many ways to invest in modern Pokemon TCG sets. So a very moderate type of response there. And it seems like the majority of people ideate with that part. Particularly, 9% said they aren't a necessary part of investing in modern Pokemon, meaning, you know, you don't need to invest in them in order to invest in modern in general. 26% or the second largest proportion of responses went to, I find they are overpriced and don't deserve the hype. And then finally, but not least, 9% said, I avoid them in general for a variety of reasons. So let's tackle these in the scale of proportion from lowest to largest. So they aren't a necessary part of investing in modern. Some people do believe that. And it's honestly not a shocking response because the fair majority of people will likely think that the best way of investing in modern Pokemon cards, mind you, none of us, no matter who it is, big, small, large content creator, been in the hobby two weeks or 20 years, doesn't matter. There is no right way to invest in modern because none of us know how it's going to play out just yet. So, you know, no one knows what Hidden Fates is going to be worth 25 years from now. A lot of us have a best guess, but believe it or not, many of us just aren't in a position to tell you because many of us don't have a functional crystal ball. Um, the other 9% response was, I avoid them in general for a variety of reasons. I figured that would be a good catch-all for anything and everything else, but I can honestly see a few different reasons why you may choose to avoid black labels, including hesitancy over the population. That's something that I am actually a big uh, proponent of because I do hesitate when it comes to population reports and how quick people are to share with you a pop one of one card, not realizing that that statement is inherently flawed, but we'll get into that in a little bit. Uh, next up was obviously they are the superior way to invest. And again, this is one of many different styles of, you know, finding ways to invest and get involved with modern Pokemon cards for the long run. Um, and again, there is an argument to be made here that yes, they are the superior way because what you're effectively doing is collecting the pristine specimens of a particular set and holding them for the long run. In theory, they should be the best way to get a graded single card and hold on to it for the long run. And we've seen that at least with vintage trading cards, this is definitely one of the ways to protect your collection's value because black labels are designed to be ideal specimens and therefore you shouldn't ever run into a situation where someone's going to question the condition of a black label card. 
All that said, you never know what's going to happen in 10 years, and that could be part of the reason why you choose to avoid uh, black labels as well. And then uh, next up would be the overpriced and don't deserve the hype. They are overpriced, and in my opinion, and I could be wrong about this, but I do believe there are some people out there that will go out of their way to price these cards at prices way higher or way too inflated a value purely because of the black label. So that's part of the reason why I included it as a particular answer. And I think the fact that it got the second highest amount of responses is actually very interesting. Um, it probably goes to show that overall, there are maybe two types of folks in the hobby when it comes to this stuff. It's either they're overpriced or they're, you know, priced high now but I expect they will go up in value. So that could be one of the ways of breaking down that data point. And then there are many ways to invest in modern Pokemon TCG sets. This is the one that I was hoping the majority of people would pick probably because, yeah, you know, they are one of them anyways. I think that's where I landed at the end of the day on the stuff as well, is that, you know, you can do it one way, you could do it another way, you could buy black labels when they come up for one set, you can skip them for another set because they're you know, overpriced and don't deserve the hype, etc., etc. But the good news is that, um, you know, they are certainly one of many options available to you should you choose to go ahead and, you know, incorporate them into your collection or into sort of a bundle of items that you're holding on to. So those are actually your, my audience, thoughts on modern black labels. So I'm glad we got to do this. Again, if you um, want to find these, they're on the community tab. So just go to the channel whenever one of these is running. You can check in. I'm going to try to have one running every week, um, but definitely feel free to click on the community tab, go over there, and then you'll find these types of things. I also post memes every once in a while, so there is that. By the way, no video on Saturday of this week, but that's why you're getting a video on Sunday. Um, and then here is the funny meme that I posted, and it's Weavile use taunt, more like Dumbreon, and then, you know, Umbreon looks sad. Anyways, now, onto the actual contents of the video. So, with all that said, and now a good fundamental understanding of the, you know, general sentiment from this audience, let's take a look and ask ourselves a couple questions. One, what is a black label? Well, I'm glad you asked. Here is a black label. So a black label is a card that is submitted to be graded with BGS or Beckett grading services and uses the four subgrade option. So mind you, Beckett does do a grading similar to PSA where they grade with just one overall grade. However, they have another option, which is the far more common option of giving four subgrades. So here is an example of a Beckett slab that has a black label. So what does a black label signify? Well, each of the four subgrades, centering edges, corners, and surface, all have attained a grade of 10. This is impressive for a variety of reasons. Remember, this card needed to be manufactured, packaged, and shipped. Then it needed to be purchased, opened, and handled by a consumer. Then it needed to be packaged, shipped, and handled to and by a grader. And after all of that, the holographic, the edges, the surface, the corners were all perfectly maintained and even more impressively, perhaps, is the fact that the centering was perfect from the moment it was cut. Bear in mind, centering is one of those things that doesn't decay over time. Edges or surface wear can occur over time, but centering is something that happens at the factory, and if it isn't perfect at the factory, it just isn't perfect, period, end of story. It's also impressive because centering is one of the only things that is perhaps purely objective when it comes to the grading process. Different graders may interpret the surface, corners, and edges with different defects and, you know, be more harsh or more nice about certain defects. However, centering is one of those things. For Beckett, 10 centering is 50-50, front and back, left and right, top and bottom. No questions asked. So it's actually very clean cut and very, very, very difficult to obtain. So what happens when all of those things are 10s? You get the results like this on screen right now. You get a black label printed for your card and it has gold, le gold lettering that shows that you obtained a 10 in every single subcategory and therefore have obtained a pristine black label Beckett 10 on a particular card. 
Here are some additional examples. Here's a Hidden Fates Charizard. I believe this is the one that sold for like $10,000, but obviously tons more have been printed since. Um, and yeah, so that's what a black label looks like. Now, you might ask the question, well, what if one of these numbers is a 9.5 or literally any other number? Well, here's a good example of that. So as you can see, this is a gold label 10, and this is usually what differentiates 10s for BGS is the color of the label. So you can see they both have a pristine grade. However, there's a different color to them, and that's what signifies a difference within the grade. So it's kind of weird, but here you can see the card also obtained a pristine 10, but this is a gold label. And as you can see, the edges got a 10, the surface got a 10, the corners got a 10, and the centering got a 9.5. As a result, this is not a perfect quote unquote black label 10, but it does get the gold numbering. I believe that you can have up to two 9.5s and two 10s and still obtain a pristine 10. If I'm wrong about that, or if anybody has any additional information, feel free to let me know that down below in the comments and I'll try to pin your post for informational purposes. Now, the other thing to bear in mind is at a certain point, these lesser subgrades will begin weighing on the overall grade. So as an example, if you get three 9.5s, the grade now becomes a 9.5, even if you still have a 10 somewhere in the mix. And then if you get four 9.5s, obviously it's still a 9.5, and then you would just restart the process of rounding down. So now if all of these were 9.5s and one got a nine, it would still be a 9.5, so on, so on, until sooner or later, those lesser nines turn the grade into a 9 instead of a 9.5. Uh, running down the list, here is an actual 9.5, and it looks like I actually stand corrected. You can only have one grade lesser than the total grade. So as you can see here, this got two 10s and two 9.5s. It didn't get a 10, it got a 9.5. So it looks like um, I've answered my own question there, but it looks like you can have one grade less than the total number, and then if you have two, it'll round down. So that's how that goes. As you can see, um, one thing that I do want to call out is that for Beckett, a 10 is a pristine card. A 9.5 is a gem mint. Now, if we're just going off vocabulary, a 9.5 gem mint is theoretically then equivalent to the PSA 10, which is also described as a gem mint card. But there are some folks who argue one way or the other over what the validity is. Of course, there are stories of people cross-grading a PSA 10 into a pristine 10. I haven't heard of black labels getting graded that way, but certainly gold labels have in the past. And finally but not least, here is a silver label Beckett card. Um, this is a nine, so it's, you know, it's a mint card, and that actually pretty much foots exactly back a PSA 9 is also described as mint from a vocabulary standpoint. And as you can see here, this card's really cool because um, you would figure it has a 9.5 and a 10, so you figure it might have had a higher grade up in the future. Uh, but the problem with this card is the centering. So the centering got an 8.5, and I believe your total grade for Beckett can be no higher than half a point away from your lowest grade. So even though there's a 9, a 9.5, and a 10, um, the fact that this was an 8.5 means the highest they can mathematically go according to their own standards is 0.5 higher, or rounding up to a full mint 9. So there is a good overview, hopefully, of all of the different types of labels that exist on the high end of Beckett's grading scale. Obviously, today's video is more focused on these cards particularly, um, the ones that receive the black label with the perfect tens, but you now have a good idea of what kind of happens if there's a slight defect or several defects that cause the grade to go down. So that's what a black label is. Now let's talk about why people froth over them. Well, to keep it simple, a couple different things. One, Beckett has historically been known as a tougher grader than PSA. And so a PSA 10 is not equal to or equivalent to a Beckett 10. That's where the whole argument that a 9.5 gem mint is in fact about as close as you'll get to a PSA 10. However, bear in mind, 
that PSA 10s don't have any kind of gradient between them. So unlike, you know, Beckett where you can have a black label and a gold label and there is a tangible difference between the two, PSA 10s are PSA 10s, which means somewhere in the population of PSA 10s do exist cards that if they were submitted to Beckett would have graded a pristine 10. Alternatively, there are other cards that exist in the PSA 10 population that if submitted to Beckett would have received a pristine gold label or a 9.5 gem mint or perhaps even a 9, just purely based on how tough a grader is. And again, the overall reputation has been Beckett is a lot tougher on trading cards than PSA has been in the past. So. One thing to consider is that Beckett black labels are considered to be the epitome. They are graded a lot more tough, at least historically and anecdotally, anecdotally uh, compared to PSA. And because of that, they are very highly sought after. The second thing is that it's the perfect card. So whenever you're looking at one of these cards, what you have to remember is that everything about this card is perfect. This is a perfectly centered card. The surface is pristine. The corners are pristine. The edges are pristine. You get it. This is a perfect card. And so there is simply no better way of obtaining a card and having it for the foreseeable future. So if you wanted to immortalize a card, Theoretically, this is the perfect way to do so because a PSA 10 still has some room for, you know, uneven centering or a slight defect. This card, there is no room for error. This is a perfect card and that is why collectors go after it so much. And finally but not least is the low population argument. One of the reasons a lot of people love these cards is because they are far and few in between. So one of the last things I wanted to do in this video is walk you through some examples of that. So let's take a quick peek over at the Beckett website. And as you can see on screen, I have the Rayquaza Gold Star, you know, classic example of a vintage card that's very highly sought after, right? So reading across the Beckett population report um, for the English version of the card, you see that there's a total of 55 cards that have ever been graded with Beckett as uh, Rayquaza Gold Stars. Now, of those, there are no black labels, there are no gold labels, there are only Gem Mint 9.5s. The Gem Mint 9.5s, there are six in existence. Six is approximately a little bit more, uh, a little bit less than 10% of the total population. And then you can see how it breaks out shortly thereafter. There's a couple, you know, threes and fours and fives. But overall, yeah, it's a very low population card. Um, and it, what's even funnier is that there's no such thing as a gold label pristine yet. So that's one of the arguments that typically get made when folks go and try to get any of these cards sold. They will very quickly say one of six in the world. So this is a vintage card, and the reason that I bring that up is because obviously these cards aren't on store shelves anymore. Um, there are a lot in personal collections probably, and a lot more sitting in PSA, BGS, CGC, up in queue to get graded. But here's the thing, it's been nearly 15 years since these cards were graded. There's a pretty solid chance that they aren't going to be in great condition. Um, you know, they were created, not graded, they were created nearly 15 probably 16 years ago depending on the print run and so there's a pretty strong chance these cards are in rough condition and they're going to grade somewhere down here in the one to eight category very few cards will ever make it up here and by the looks of it there may not ever be any gold labels or black labels unless someone sitting on a psa 10 tries to grade it speaking of psa let's take a look at that so here you can see the equivalent over at PSA. There are 536 cards which have been graded, so approximately 10 times more than at BGS. This is something that I want to point out. The thing is, is that love them or hate them, PSA just gets more volume, period, end of story. There's a reason 10 times the amount of cards have gone to PSA than have gone to Beckett. And part of that is probably the accessibility of PSA, and part of that is also probably either a combination of brand loyalty, brand recognition, or convenience. I can't tell you which of the three it is, but I have a feeling it's a mixture of the three. As you can see, 47, or about, you know, 8 to 9% of the total has been graded a 10. 
So if we're looking at it from the perspective of, okay, highest grade over total population, it's kind of in line, um, you know, where the tens are effectively the equivalent, as I had mentioned earlier in this video, to the 9.5s. Yeah, I mean, you know, here it's about 9%, and also here it's about 8 to 9%. In theory, these are more exclusive, the PSA ones, ironically enough, because if I'm doing the math right in my head, they might actually be a smaller percentage of the total. But that's one thing to consider. Whenever someone throws a Beckett population report at you, just bear in mind that by and far, what you see is just an overall smaller number of cards. So if someone's gonna say population one of one, and it's you know a total of 55, versus PSA where there's 536, there is an argument to be made there about how impressive your you know total number is. Maybe if more cards got submitted to Beckett, there would be a you know a stronger argument. If it's population one of one and only one exists out of the thousand cards that have been submitted, it would perhaps be a more compelling case. However, at this time, again, this situation just doesn't exist for this vintage Pokemon card. Now let's talk briefly about a modern Pokemon card, because that's really what we're here to talk about. The reason that I show you guys the uh, Rayquaza is because this is a vintage card. Again, not on store shelves anymore. There are very few good copies out there still in existence, and honestly, no one's out here trying to rip open EX Deoxys packs or EX Deoxys booster boxes, because we all know where that's going to lead us. Um, so, all things considered, this is one of those cards. You don't expect the population to change much in the in in the coming years, and if it does, I guarantee you it'll be somewhere within the one to eight spectrum. Very few nines and tens are going to get added to either population report, at least according to my own thoughts and theories. Now, if you look at modern, the problem with modern black labels begins to become more apparent. So let's take a look at that. Um, as you can see right here, I have the 2019 Sun and Moon Hidden Fates Charizard. So here is the Charizard GX Ultra Rare SV49. That is this card right here, SV49 Charizard GX, shiny. So let's talk about it. Immediately, the number that should jump out to you is 1,946. The other number that should jump out to you is 182, which is approximately 10% of the largest population of black labels I think I've ever seen in my life. Anyways, my point is 182 over 1946 is approximately 9 or 10%. Again, pretty much on par with what we just saw for Rayquaza. Problem is, there's now 182 black label Charizards in the world. Mind you, what's hilarious about that is that this was the first one ever graded, and this one was actually sold for $10,100. And this was shocking and breaking news back in the day in, eh, give or take, September of 2019. Um, but now you can find these things all over eBay. Now, here's, here's, here's my problem with that. Um, you see a population report like this, and then you hear people continue to insist that modern black labels are the only way to go. And I think that's why I take a hard stance and I say no. I don't think they're the only way to go. I think they're part of a balanced approach to modern investments. Because again, many of these cards are going to only go up in number over time. If we take a look across the pond and we look at PSA, what you'll see is that a similar story begins to unfold. Full Art Charizard GX, um, and then you, you can see here the total population ever submitted is 5,500, right? So just stop for a minute and take a look at this number right here. This is the number of PSA 9s that have ever been graded with PSA and there's 2,046 of them, right? Beckett's entire population report is less than the number of PSA 9s that have been graded ever up till now. So just stop and take a moment to appreciate that, right? The total number of cards ever graded at one company is only less than the PSA 9s that exist with PSA. The reason I bring that up and I stop to make a point of it is because for anyone arguing that volume isn't important and that, you know, it's population one of one. Yeah, but it's population one of one in a far smaller population 
than with you know PSA. Now, if PSA had black labels and the same number of uh, cards ever graded, it would be more impressive because now you're not saying, oh, well, it's one of 100, it's now one of 1,000. And in this particular case, that's a true achievement because that means for the 1,000 cards that were ever graded, only one was a perfect specimen. Over here with Beckett, what we're saying is, well, yeah, it's about 10% of the total population, but that means nothing compared to the total amount of cards that have been graded. What's even scarier is that if you add up PSA, BGS, and CGC, which I haven't even mentioned in this video, but if you add all three of those up now, it creates even more noise because effectively all that means is that Beckett has a very small population of cards in total compared against the total, and as a result, it's not surprising that their population reports are going to be very small, and therefore, if you really believe and vibe with that argument, there is then a argument to be made that population one of one is not impressive because they don't see significant enough volume for that to be an impressive number. Of course it's going to be population one of one. You guys only graded a couple of cards compared to PSA or compared to the total of all cards ever graded for a particular set. So. That's one of the things to point out. The other thing to point out, I mean, you know, and this kind of is, uh, is, is a weird quirk, but obviously this was a very popular card for a very popular set. Um, they graded 3,137 PSA 10s, uh, so there's then also the argument to be made that, hey, some of these cards, mathematically speaking, are probably BGS Black Label 10 worthy. So if these folks grab these cards and ship them over here, you could see this number increase over time. Again, do I think that will happen? No. I think a lot of people are very happy with PSA cards. They like their PSA 10s and they'll probably keep it that way. But just to kind of show you that there is a little bit of a fallacy that exists within this number because you would think this number is stagnant and, you know, especially if you look at it compared to like the total, you might say like, oh wow, 10%. But the thing is, is that, again, there are a, a number of cards that exist in this number that could cross grade to a black label, and there are other cards out there that haven't been graded yet that probably could. And that brings me to maybe my concluding point. When you look at this number over here for the Rayquaza, one of the things that never crosses your mind is that this number is going to spike in the next couple of years. Um, it may go up significantly given how small a number this is, but honestly, unless this population report is not up to date and doesn't reflect grades from the past 18 months, there is a chance that this is the number as of 2021. And that means that, you know, the big rush for Pokemon, the big craze for Pokemon has died down. And this is the number that exists at this time. The thing is, is that for a card like this, the Sun and Moon uh, Hidden Fates Charizard, this card isn't going anywhere. There are still Hidden Fates tins available online, there are still people streaming Hidden Fates openings, and people have hoarded so much of this set unopened that in the future, it doesn't surprise me if there is still a consistent stream of Charizards getting submitted to Beckett to be graded for you know, black label status. Now, that is unfortunately not really that impressive a feat because you can look at it right here and see that there's already 182 of them. And similarly, I think the Charizards across the pond at PSA are going to do the same thing. So the thing is, is that for anyone who considers BGS black labels the ideal way of collecting, do bear in mind that fundamentally speaking, it should be based not on population. It shouldn't be because this card is population one of one or one of 10 or one of 100, because the truth of the matter is, there are more people holding on to product than ever before. There are more people collecting binders and packing them full of this stuff than ever before. And this is modern, this isn't vintage. That means it's available on the streets, it's available on Troll and Toad, it's available on the internet, and you can pull it from your local target as well. The problem with all of that is that all this means is that there's higher than ever the likelihood that more and more of this stuff will get graded over time as opposed to more vintage cards or more obscure cards or cards that don't have the same popularity and presence that modern cards have. 
So what's my final takeaway? For me, black label cards present a really cool opportunity if they come up at a discount or sale price because they are really, really, really high quality specimens and that means they are the ideal way of collecting. So there is something so fulfilling about getting a card that you know has been scrutinized to probably the industry's highest standard for grading a trading card. All that said, I wouldn't fundamentally base any amount of investment on them. The reason for that is because I don't think these will outperform going into the future. The raw truth of the matter is again, more people than ever are storing, stocking, and collecting. And what that means is that given the popularity of Pokemon over the past couple of years, there are going to be tons of these cards in existence. I believe there is a fundamental misconception about black labels and part of that is driven by the vintage market. In the vintage market, black labels are fundamentally one of the best possible investments and the reason for that is because vintage cards aren't being printed anymore and so having a perfect specimen is in fact a achievement for the hobby. However, that doesn't bear true for modern because in modern so much of this stuff is getting opened collected and sought after that the raw truth of the matter is it's not as special for modern as it is for vintage however if you are able to take that away and out of your equation and make investments based on the specimen itself and understanding that this may not be the next Bitcoin or the next Ethereum, et cetera, et cetera, I do believe it's one of a very good set of options you have for getting involved in and for investing in modern trading cards. But with all that said, friends, thanks again for checking out another video. I hope you enjoyed today's video, and if you did, feel free to leave a like on the video and a comment letting me know about your thoughts on modern trading cards and some of the data that I've showed down below. Of course, if you're not already, feel free to subscribe to the Gengar Gang. And other than that, I hope you guys are having an amazing day, and we will talk soon. Peace.